Okay, Moritz. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to the seminar. Thanks for coming. Uh, I was uh, asked to give some, some survey talk on easy quantum groups and uh, quantum permutations. So these are two complementary uh, subjects. I will uh, tell you a little bit why, why they're complementary. And uh, maybe just as a small teaser, um, if you like SN plus and OM plus, so the free uh, quantum, uh, orthogonal quantum group and the free symmetric quantum group, then uh, you, 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 might, you might see this talk as uh, yeah, so, some generalization of these objects. And if you like diagrams like these that you see on, on the side, or temporally leap algebra, plan, planar diagrams, then uh, I will also have something for you in this talk. Or if you like graphs and symmetries, we will also mention this in the talk. And if you're friends with Alice and Bob, then you will also meet them again throughout this talk. Okay, so let's uh, get started with the math. So let me first uh, tell you a little bit about the context uh, in this talk. So the context is quantum groups. Um, I, it's, I suspect that uh, quite a few of, of you are somewhat familiar with quantum groups. Nevertheless, let me uh, briefly tell you something about this, uh, these objects. So there's a whole world of uh, quantum groups and it's a generalization of groups. So you have the class of groups or in our context to be more precise, uh, locally compact groups. And there's a generalization to uh, quantum groups. So quantum groups are not groups, it's something more general. And when you speak about quantum groups, then the world is a bit diverse. So there's an analytic appro approach or topological approach and there's a more algebraic one. The algebraic one is usually centered around Hopf algebras with some extra structure. And uh, the analytic one, which we will follow in this talk, um, is uh, from Voronovich from the 80s. But they are friends. I mean, this analytic and the algebraic approach, they are, uh, they are somewhat linked. But uh, just to make sure that if you speak about quantum groups, uh, some people might understand something different. I'm in this uh, context of Voronovich. The most general class are locally compact quantum groups. And there's a subclass which are compact quantum groups. And there's a subclass of this one, which is compact matrix quantum groups. And this will be our class. And within these compact matrix quantum groups, we will consider these uh, easy quantum groups as well as uh, quantum automorphism groups of graphs. So this is just to show you the landscape. And uh, as it is depicted here, uh, we see that our objects are partly within the class of quantum groups and partly uh, groups. So both objects that will appear. Some of our quantum groups will be in fact groups. And on the right hand side, uh, you see uh, this, this bubble is, is now uh, turned into this uh, uh, or trapezoid or whatever. Uh, and if you know these objects, here's Sn plus uh, and here's Un plus, then this uh, might tell you something. So the easy quantum groups, they are in between Sn and Un plus. So they are in this uh, regime. These are the easy quantum groups. And then there are these quantum automorphism groups of graphs, which are uh, below Sn plus and Sn. So this is why I said they are somewhat co co complementary. So we will make this more precise in a minute. So this is just a teaser, but we will see that uh, we will consider one class which sits uh, here in, in this uh, part and another class which sits here in this class. And in total, we will cover a, a huge portion of uh, quantum subgroups of UN plus. So uh, I'll also regarding the context, uh, let me put it into the context of, let's call it quantum mathematics or non-commutative mathematics. I know this is not a very um, uh, well-defined notion, but let me use it nevertheless. And uh, most of it you probably know. So there's the theory of Assista algebras, and you can see this as a non-commutative analog of topology, right? So you know that commutative Assista algebras correspond to compact uh, Hausdorff spaces, so in a way, this is topology. And uh, then non-commutative C-star algebras are kind of non-commutative topology. So this might be well known to you. This is Gelf van Neumark. And you know probably also the theory of von Neumann algebras. Von Neumann algebras, that's a measure theory in a non-commutative setting. So again, commutative von Neumann algebras correspond to measurable spaces. 
And in this sense, we say that non-commutative von Neumann algebras are kind of non-commutative measurable spaces. There's another non-commutative theory that's free probability theory. You can see it as a counterpart of probability theory. There's Alain Kohn's non-commutative geometry, which is a quantum version of differential geometry. And then there are groups and uh, there are these quantum groups. So this is why I'm putting this uh, table here, because we will speak about these quantum groups and it fits into this table as a non-commutative counterpart of some classical theory. And this is really in the gelfand Neimark spirit, okay? So uh, if we are in the commutative situation, then we will uh, be, and we will have groups. I will tell you in a minute what this means precisely, but th this is the, uh, the philosophy here on this table. I also added quantum information theory and information theory in this table and also free analysis and complex analysis. This is not quite in the gelfand Neimark spirit, but still I would like to count it to this family just for the reason that on the left-hand side, you have these classical theories and they do interplay. I mean, uh, for instance, if you're in topology and you want to uh, consider symmetries of these spaces, then you would need uh, groups as a formalization of symmetries. And on this uh, same, on the right-hand side, if you're with, dealing with C-star algebras and you want to uh, study the symmetries, you might, might want to use quantum groups. Or if you have some probabilistic aspects and you use information theory, then maybe free probability and quantum information theory are the pairs on the right-hand side. I think this quantum mathematics is something that is just evolving these days. I mean, each of these theories is um, quite quite old or not, well, I mean, C-star algebras, von Neumann algebras, it's 30s and 40s, and all the other ones are main, maybe from the 80s. But I think it's just now the time that we're uh, understanding how, how all these theories interact. And this is something which I find quite exciting. So let me uh, take this as the broader context, this quantum mathematics, and uh, let us now consider these quantum groups a bit more in detail. Let me give you a definition. Here's the definition. You know, the fundamental theorem, uh, let me just recall from gelfand Neimark, if you have a unital Sista algebra, then a, the C-star algebra is commutative if and only if it is isomorphic to the continuous scalar valued functions on a compact space. And this is an equivalence. And in this sense, we say this is gelfand Neimark duality. Commutative case is uh, compact spaces and non-commutative is somewhat non-commutative compact spaces. Okay, so this is the well-known gelfand Neimark theorem. And building on this theorem, Vodanovich defined uh, compact matrix quantum groups. A compact matrix quantum group is by definition uh, given by a unital C-star algebra, which is generated by elements Uij, n square elements Uij. So uh, I have the C-star algebra A, there are these elements Uij in there, and as a C-star algebra, it's generated by these elements. If I put all these elements into a matrix, call it U, then this matrix must be invertible, as well as the matrix formed by the adjoints of these elements. And we have a, a star homomorphism from A to A tensor A, uh, which maps Uij to this uh, sum of Uik tensor Ukj. So these are our actions uh, of a compact matrix quantum group, um, as defined by Wodanovich in the 1980s. At the time, he called it uh, pseudo groups, but later he called it compact matrix quantum groups. And then later in the 90s, he also defined what a compact quantum group is. And then even later, locally compact quantum groups were uh, defined. So historically, this is in the heart of the analytic approach to quantum groups. And there's a fundamental theorem by Wodanovich in the spirit of gelfand Neimark, And it says, if you have a compact matrix quantum group, well then there's an underlying C-star algebra. And if the C-star algebra is commutative, then in fact, my C-star algebra is, by gelfand Neimark isomorphic to the continuous functions on some compact space. And this space is a group. Okay, so this is the fundamental theorem. If you have a compact matrix quantum group whose underlying C-star algebra is commutative, then in fact, you have the functions on a compact group uh, and vice versa. So this is a very nice extension of uh, gelfand Neimark theorem to this quantum group setting. And in this sense, we can say that compact quantum groups, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, compact 
quantum groups generalize compact groups. Okay, so the class of compact groups, or here to be more precise, of compact matrix groups, um, is contained in the class of compact matrix quantum groups in perfect analogy to the C-star algebra situation. So this is the theory of um, quantum groups. It's a rich theory. It has some higher integration. It has links with Hopf algebras, and uh, you can, yeah, you can you can say it's it's really uh, a very solid uh, theory. But let us take a look at a at a couple of examples, which we will also need in this talk. Um, the free orthogonal quantum group has been defined by Shuzu Wang in the 90s, and it's given as follows. You take the universal C-star algebra generated by UIJ, such that all the generators are self-adjoint, and they satisfy this relation. So the sum over UIK, UJK equals delta IJ, and the same sum over UK, I, UK, J. And if you spell this out, you see that this basically means that the matrix U is orthogonal. Because consider this matrix U, and uh, consider U times U transpose, and then you see U times U transpose equals the identity. That's exactly this first relation. So this basically means um, I take the entries of a um, non-commutative orthogonal matrix, if you want. So that's O n plus. That's a, uni that's a universal C-star algebra generated by UIJs. You can check all these axioms. So in, in fact, it's, a, it's a, uh, generated by UIJs by definition. The matrix U is invertible. That's uh, basically this, step, this uh, relation here. Uh, U bar is the same as U because all the elements are self-adjoint. And then you can check that you have this star homomorphism that I uh, gave on the, that I showed to you on the previous slide. So it's in fact, it's a, it's a quantum group. And now what happens if the C-star algebra is commutative? So let's suppose that all the generators UIJ commute. Then we can uh, see that this C-star algebra is a commutative C-star algebra. So it's uh, the continuous function on something by Voronovich on a compact group. And this group is ON, so the group of orthogonal matrices. And in this sense, we can say that this C-star algebra gives rise to a non-commutative version of the functions on the orthogonal group. Okay, so we really do have some quantum analog of the orthogonal group here. And uh, we can even say that this C-star algebra uh, surjects onto the functions on ON. And in this sense, we say that ON is contained in ON plus. And this means in the quantum world, we have more orthogonal rotations than in the classical world. Okay, so we really have a have more symmetries in the, in the quantum world. That's a, a nice feature here. There's a second example of the free unitary quantum group. And here, well, we basically have to take a unitary matrix and take the entries. And that's what Shuzu Wang also defined in the 90s. So you take the universal C-star algebra generated by UIJs, such that the matrix formed by these elements is a unitary. But now, a slightly technical issue arises because we did not only uh, impose that u is uh, invertible but also u bar. So let's also suppose that u bar is unitary. In the commutative case, this is equivalent, but in the non commutative, we have to impose both. So if u and u bar are unitary, this is our definition of this free unitary quantum group. And again, this free unitary quantum group contains the classical unitary group. So this means, again, we have more rotations in the quantum world. Let me speak about a third example, which uh, will be the most prominent for this talk. That's the free symmetric quantum group. And the, the game is as before. We define some C-star algebra as a universal C-star algebra. So that's here. We take UIJs. All the elements are projections. And the rows and columns sum up to one, respectively. So we say a matrix that satisfies this relation, we call it a magic unitary. Um, and I'm claiming that this is a good quantum analog of the symmetric group. Why is this so? Well, let's take a look at these relations and let's imagine that all the UIJs are scalars. So what happens if I have a magic unitary with scalar entries? So, well, what, what does it mean that a scalar is self-adjoint? It means it's real. And what does it mean that it equals its square? 
Well, it means it can only be zero or one, right? So if my uij's are from the complex numbers, then these uh, first equations tell me that my elements are in fact either zero or one. And how about these sums? Well, these sums tell me in each row, they sum, should sum up to one. So there can only be one unit and all the others must be zero. So this means in each row, there's exactly one unit, the others are zero. And in each column, there's exactly one unit, the others are zero. Well, that's the definition of a permutation matrix, isn't it? So if I have a matrix satisfying these relations, where all the entries are scalars, then I do have a permutation matrix. So in this sense, these relations are really um, the algebraic relations of a permutation matrix where I allow operator valued solutions. So this is also one way how you can see all these three examples. You can say, I'm taking matrices where the entries may be matrices themselves, and there are solutions to equations which come from groups. So if you take an orthogonal matrix and ask what do the entries satisfy as algebraic relations, they are these. And then the quantum group allows operator valued solutions for these equations. And the same for u n plus and for s n plus. And again, our quantum version of the symmetric group has more uh, is larger than, than the classical case. So this means in a way we have more quantum ways of permuting endpoints rather than just permuting them. So this will be in the second half of the talk. This will be the main topic. But for the moment, let me just tell you, we have these quantum versions of the classical groups and we can justify why this is natural. So these are my, my objects for the moment. Is there a question regarding these examples or are you happy with these examples? What about SUN? Yeah, <laughs> well, SUN is also a nice uh, quantum group. That's right. I'm not mentioning it here. I, I will mention it later, but uh, that's for sure also a very important example, but it doesn't fit into uh, my, my framework, which I, which I will uh, speak about next. So this is why I'm not mentioning it here. Okay, so um, then there's the representation theory for these quantum groups, and it's um, derived from the classical uh, situation. So there's a tanaka Klein duality for quantum groups. This was also uh, given by Voronovich from the 80s. Let me state it informally. If you have a compact matrix quantum group, then its representation category is a good tensor category. So you can specify what good means. I don't want to do it, but Voronovich did. So you can say it's a tensor category with, with certain um, uh, properties. Well, as such, this is not so exciting, but the exciting part is the converse. Whenever you take such an abstract tensor category with exactly these properties, then you will find a compact matrix quantum group whose representation theory is your given abstract category. So you really have this duality here. This is very nice because it means that you can uh, specify quantum groups in terms of their representation categories. That's a very powerful result because it helps you to study these, qu these quantum groups on the one hand, but also on the other hand, it, it provides a way of uh, um, finding many examples of quantum groups. And this is uh, the way we will go. Let me quickly say that on the technical level, this identification of the quantum groups with the representation category goes via intertwiner spaces. What is an intertwiner? An intertwiner is a linear map from some uh, vector space to another, which intertwines two representations of my quantum group. I'm not telling you what a representation of this uh, quantum group is, but uh, yeah, you, you might have seen intertwiners in other contexts. So intertwiners are our technical tool uh, to, to describe these tensor categories of the representations. And our informal definition of easy quantum groups is a easy, an easy quantum group is a subgroup of UN plus whose intertwiner spaces are given by partitions. So combinatorial objects or diagrams, if you want. So that's the, that's the definition. And uh, yeah, the source is this Tanaka-Krein duality, because as I said, 
if you specify such a nice tensor category, you will immediately get a quantum group. That's tanaka Krein duality by Voronovich. So we will specify tensor categories in terms of diagrams, and then we will obtain a quantum group by this tanaka Krein duality. The idea is not new. This comes, uh, this has been studied since 100 years. Schurweil duality and Brouwer diagrams, that's exactly the same spirit. But now this is in the realm of quantum groups. So let me now pass to these easy quantum groups. Okay, I'm realizing that red is hard to read. So maybe let me turn this white. Maybe that's nicer. Um, so let me speak about easy quantum groups now. And uh, they are, as I, as I said, they are in this regime. So in between SN and UN plus. This will be the first um, thing we will consider. So here's the precise definition of easy quantum groups. First, I will tell you what is a category of partitions. A category of partitions is a combinatorial object. So I'm just taking partitions of sets which means I take finite sets, I decompose them into disjoint subsets called the blocks, non-empty disjoint subsets, and I depict them diagrammatically. Okay, so here, for instance, uh, this is a, what is it, eight elementary set, and I decompose it into, into this block, and uh, this is a, is a singleton block, and here are two points together in one block. Okay, so that's just a way of depicting decompositions of finite sets into disjoint subsets. And a category of partitions is a collection of partitions which is closed under the following operations. Let's take two partitions P and Q. And uh, the tensor product shall be in our category again. What is the tensor product? I take one partition, I take another one, I just put them side by side and I get a new one. And this shall be in our category. This is action number one. Action number two is we can also stack them one on top of the other. So I take one partition, I put them on the other, if the number of points uh, match here. And now I'm just following the lines. Okay, so here this upper point is connected to what? Well, to this guy and to this guy and to this guy. Okay, so I, I have on the right hand side that they are linked. And now I'm following the lines here. So it's also linked to this point and it's also linked to this point. And now it's hard to, to see what I'm doing. But if you're just following these strings uh, of, of the diagrams on the left-hand side, you will produce a new picture. And this new picture shall also be in your category. That's action number two. And the involution of a partition shall be in the category, which means I just flip it. I just flip it along the horizontal axis. And the new uh, partition shall also be in our category. So a category of partitions is a collection of partitions which is closed under these three operations and it also contains two base partitions namely this pair partition and this identity partition so that's our definition i will tell you in a minute why this is a good definition but for the moment let us just take it as a combinatorial toy and uh, let's take a look at, at some examples so all partitions certainly form a uh, category of partitions. Okay, so that's that's trivial. But also, if I uh, restrict to pair partitions, so if I only allow that uh, I connect two points with each other, and of course, if I have a partition which only connects two points, um, so pairs of uh, of uh, points, and I put it side by side with another such partition, then the resulting partition will also connect just pairs of points, and the same for the other operation. So you can check that pair partitions satisfy all these actions up there. You can also uh, consider non-crossing partitions, planar ones. So now uh, it's uh, not allowed that, that uh, two strings cross. So, so this would be not allowed. So for instance, this one is, uh, is not allowed. Um, and also this non-crossingness or planarness is preserved under these operations. And then you can take the inter intersection of these two and then you will get non-crossing pair partitions. So these are um, four examples of categories of partitions. And just as a small spoiler, non-crossing pair partitions, you might have 
heard under the name of temporally leap uh, algebra or temporally leap diagrams. Okay, so that's an alternative name. And pair partitions, you, you might have heard it under the name of Brouwer diagrams. Okay, so these are well-known objects in other domains. So these are the examples. And now the, the uh, nice thing with these categories of partitions is it models exactly this good tensor category in Voronovich sense. So whenever I have such a category of partitions, I can associate such a nice tensor category and then I will obtain a quantum group. And this is by definition an easy quantum group. So a quantum group is called easy if all its intertwiner spaces are given by these um, categories, by one category of partitions. So this means the intertwiners shall be the span of certain maps TP, which are indexed by partitions. Okay, so again, I take this category of partitions, then I associate a linear map to each of these partitions. I will tell you in a minute how. And then I consider this span of these maps TP, and this will be a good tensor category in Voronovich sense. Technically, if I take the Karubian envelope, but let's not bother with the details. So it's a good tensor category in Voronovich sense. So this means it gives rise to a quantum group by this tanaka Krein result. And this is my easy quantum group. Okay, easy quantum groups are quantum groups where the representation theory is given by categories of partitions. And this is a very nice uh, and, and um, easy to handle uh, combinatorial object. So we can extend this definition to a, a unitary case. So we can also say, say that uh, unitary quantum groups are uh, easy. And then I just have to take a brush and color uh, the definition up there. So I, now each of the points can be either uh, white or black. So I must color all the points and then, uh, yeah, I will get colored partitions. And then I can have the same machine. So this is, uh, how we can extend the definition from the orthogonal case to the unitary case. The orthogonal case has been defined by Theo Banneke and Roland Speicher in 2009. And then the unitary case has been defined by Pierre Tarago and myself in 2017. Now, let us uh, take a closer look at this assignment of this, uh, of this P to TP. So this is also something you, you might have seen whenever you, you, you've uh, seen temporally leap um, diagrams uh, in, in your life. So here's a partition P and we can associate a linear map to it by just saying, okay, let's take the basis vector in CN to tensor K. So the canonical basis vectors consisting in these uh, tensor products and we map it to the sum of all other canonical basis vectors. If the indices of my input vector match the indices of this summand. So here there are these uh, numbers delta p. They can be either 0 or 1. When is it 0? When is it 1? Well, what do I do? I take uh, this partition p and I decorate the point, the points with these indices from the uh, initial uh, vector. So I write i1, i2, and so on on the upper points. And then I take these j's <coughs> and decorate the lower points with these j's. And now, if um, these lines connect equal indices with equal indices, then my delta will be 1, otherwise it's 0. Here's an example. The upper line is decorated by 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, and the lower one by 4, 4, 1. And I see these lines connect only ones with each other, so that's OK. The two is uh, lonely and four and four is connected. So delta equals one in that case. Another example here, I have a block. Uh, here's a block. But in this block, I have a one on the upper parts and a three on the lower part. So here a one is connected with a three. So that's forbidden, which means delta equals zero. So this is exactly how you would associate a linear map to a temporally leap uh, diagram if you want. And uh, so these um, um, intertwiners give rise to, to relations. Let us take a look at these relations. So if I take this partition, which consists in this pair, then the associate linear map uh, is of this form. So it maps uh, one 
to the sum over ej tensor ej. And if I take a look at this intertwining relation, then I will uh, obtain this uh, algebraic relation of orthogonality. So maybe this is a bit too fast, but uh, if I write u tensor 2 as the matrix consisting in, with entries u i1 j1, u i2 j2, and then I multiply with this matrix coming from tp, then I have a matrix multiplication, I can compare the coefficients, and then I see that it's exactly this algebraic relation. Okay, so if you really sit down for 10 minutes and do the calculation, then, or maybe it's only five, then, then, then you will see that this algebraic relation follows from this intertwining relation. Okay, so, so I mean, recall, what did I say is an easy quantum group? It means that the intertwiners are given by these maps TP. So what does it mean that the map TP associated to this partition is in the intertwiner space? It means that this intertwiner relation holds, and this implies this algebraic relation, which is just orthogonality of the matrix U. So it's a very natural uh, correspondence of this partition and the relation. And if we take this uh, partition here, so this crossing partition to upper and to lower points connected in this way, then the associated uh, linear map is just a flip. And uh, the associated uh, algebraic relation means that all the UIJs commute. Okay, so you can, you can spell this out algebraically and uh, it's a not so difficult computation. But the, the takeaway message here is that crossings in our diagrams they correspond to commutation relations. Okay, this is interesting for us as, as quantum mathematicians because uh, we're dealing exactly with this difference between commutativity and non-commutativity. So this means if we want to have non-commutativity, we should avoid crossings in the diagrams. Okay, so that's the takeaway message here. And that's exactly uh, what we will do now in the, in the sequel. Sorry. So take, take this as the takeaway message, crossings correspond to commutativity relations. And here's a small table. So if you take ON, the orthogonal group, then what would be the category of partitions uh, associated to it? So ON, the orthogonal group, is an easy quantum group. In fact, it's an easy group. And the category of partitions is all pair partitions. So you see, I have crossings here. Well, that's not a miracle because it's a group. And this is also uh, known under the name of Brouwer diagrams. Okay, so Brouwer did this in the 30s. He described the representation theory of the orthogonal group in terms of these diagrams in this tanaka krein duality sense. Okay, so that's really um, old school mathematics if you want. But now we can do the quantum version of it. So O and plus this free orthogonal quantum group what is its corresponding category of partitions? It's all non-crossing pair partitions. Okay, recall crossings correspond to commutativity relations. We want to go quantum, so we should avoid crossings. And indeed, if we take these pair partitions, but if we uh, forbid crossings, then we get the non-crossing pair partitions and we get the representation theory of O and plus, this quantum version of the orthogonal group. And these diagrams are also known as temporal elite diagrams. The representation category of the symmetric group are all partitions. The representation category of SN plus are all non-crossing partitions. Of UN, we have colored pair partitions. This is also known from Chauvel duality. And for this quantum version of UN plus, we have colored non-crossing pair partitions. So this means all these three examples we've seen so far, they appear here in this, uh, in this list. And uh, yeah, it's a very natural correspondence. And as you see, the step from group to quantum group is just by restricting our diagrams to the non-crossing situation. Okay, so this is uh, the theory of, of these easy quantum groups. Now you can wonder how rich is this theory? So I said, it's a nice machine for producing examples. So how about more examples? Well, here's some classification. Uh, and again, apologies for the choice of colors, which is okay on my uh, iPad, but not 
in, uh, in the web, apparently. So here's the classification of the orthogonal or uh, let's say real case. So if a quantum group is a subgroup of O n plus, uh, and if it's easy, then it's one of these three cases. So it's completely classified by Sven Raum and myself from 2016. Either G is in the non hyperoctahedral case. Okay, that's just a name for you. So these, let me call it, it's the, the sporadic cases. So, uh, and this is, includes Sn, Sn plus, On, On plus. So guys that we have seen so far. And then there are some guys which you have not seen uh, before, but uh, never mind. And uh, we, you can also have some, some constructions with a cyclic group of order two, either the uh, Cartesian product or the free product. Um, so this is just to give you a feeling. These are somewhat the sporadic cases. The generic case is that you have a uh, semi-direct product of a quotient of the free product of the cyclic group for the two. And the kernel must be invariant under Sn. And then you take this by cross product construction. So this is an honest quantum group. Because if your group is non-abelian, then it's dual. It's not a group uh, again, but it's a, it's a quantum group. So this is really a quantum group. And this is somewhat the generic case. So the bulk of the theory is in this uh, non this, this uncountable class of uh, easy quantum groups. And then there's a third class, uh, and this, it corresponds to um, this category generated by pi k's. And let me call it the mysterious case, because this is the case that we did not understand so far. So I, I decided to have some open questions in my talk. So here's an open question. Describe these quantum groups uh, corresponding to these categories of partitions. I don't know, in terms of products or in terms of other, unknown, of other known objects, I have no idea how to do it. And here's uh, an algebraic description of this, of this generators, of this category. It's given by A1, A2, and so on up to AK. And then you go down again to A1, and then you go up again to AK, and you go down to A1. So if, in, in case you've, you've seen such a pattern, uh, I don't know, maybe there's some, some link to some other objects, but it's the case that we don't understand so well for the moment. Anyhow, I mean, we, we, we say it can be, um, if, if it is easy, it's in one of these three cases, so the classification is uh, completed. We can also do the classification in the unitary case, so uh, without assuming that the elements are self-adjoint. So let me call it the complex case. So this has been started by Pierre Tarago and myself in 2018. My PhD student, Daniel Kromada, com contributed in 2018. And together with my PhD student, Alexander Mang, we have also some results, but it's incomplete. So for instance, if we are in between Sn plus and uh, Un plus, then uh, we have this family of, of groups. So I'm just showing it here for, for showing that there is some classification. You can also, uh, I mean, now our generators are not self-adjoint, but you can um, assume something like normality. So this relation here, uij star ukl equals uij ukl star. So if kl equals ij, this is normality, but it's a bit more. So the generators are normal, but something more. Then I can uh, write them as some, some uh, let's say, cyclic group extensions of the orthogonal case. But we also have something uh, in between un and un plus. And if you want, these are all quantizations of the unitary group. So take the unitary group and ask for quantum versions of it. So for all quantum groups whose abelianization is the unitary group. And uh, this, we, we classified this class together with Alexander Mang. And these are two families. They're indexed by cyclic groups and they're indexed, another family is indexed by sub groups of uh, N0 with the plus. So that's, that, that's, that's a nice feature of these sub groups. I mean, there are many of these sub groups. Uh, it's also called numerical semigroups. Um, at least uh, um, if you ask for, for another axiom. So there's also some, something which we did not understand so, so far. 
can we describe these quantum groups as certain products with these sub semigroups? And what is the link with numerical semigroups? Um, I don't know, but this uh, tells us that this th theory is very rich because there are many, many, many sub semigroups of the natural numbers, surprisingly. And the theory of numerical semigroups, I, I recently got a book which is only on numerical semigroups, so it's a whole theory. And uh, to each of these numerical semigroups, we can associate one of these quantum groups. And uh, well, we have not completely understood what this, what this uh, link is about. Um, yeah, but it basically tells us that we have many ways of quantizing the unitary group. Maybe this is the takeaway message at this point. Think of the unitary group, ask for quantum versions of this unitary group, and we can give you a really large family uh, that all are quantizations of this unitary group. As I said, the classification is incomplete, so there's still some work to be done. My last slide on the easy quantum groups before I come to the quantum permutations. Uh, some facts on these easy quantum groups, so just a list without uh, many references. Um, these easy quantum groups, they link with free probability via Definetti theorems. So in classical probability theory, IID sequences correspond to invariance under permutations. In free probability, there's free independence, and this corresponds to invariance under this quantum permutation group. So this is a link with free probability. If you're an operator algebraist and you don't, uh, you're not interested in quantum groups, here are reduced C-star algebras, which are, which are kind of nice. They are non-nuclear, exact, simple. They have a metric approximation property. They are k-amenable, and we know their k-theory. So we know k0 and k1 of the associated C-star algebras. This has been done by Christian Vogt. We can also consider the associated um, von Neumann algebras. So this is a short notation for either the von Neumann algebra associated to O n plus or the von Neumann algebra associated to U n plus. And these von Neumann algebras, they are strongly solid, non-injective, full prime to one factors. They have the Hargrove approximation property, no Carton subalgebra, and they are not isomorphic to the free group factors. So this is some things we know about the von Neumann algebras. We know something about the Hochschild dimension. The Hochschild dimension is three. We know the L2 Betty numbers, they vanish unless for u and plus. There's a link with Delin interpolation uh, categories. So I think Ehud Meyer gave a talk on Delin interpolation categories in this seminar a couple of weeks ago. So you have the representation theory of the symmetric group and you have some, uh, the, num the number of generators of a symmetric group is usually a natural number, but Delin gave a way of, of having a complex number of generators of such a symmetric group. So these are interpolation categories. And you, for, for each of these uh, categories of partitions, you can also uh, uh, define such interpolating representation categories and you can study them. This has been done by Laura Maaßen and Johannes Flake recently. And uh, they also have some couple of nice results on these uh, new delinear interpolation categories. You can study extremal traces on limit algebras. This has been done by Jonas Wahl. And there are also generalizations, partition quantum groups, three-dimensional partitions, and so on, also non-easy quantum groups. So there's a whole uh, theory around these, these objects. But uh, if you want to have an open question for many of these properties, we only know it for the uh, famous guys, namely SN plus, ON plus, UN plus, but we don't know for the others. So there's a lot to be done. A major open question in uh, compact matrix quantum groups is, is there in a quantum group between the symmetric group and the quantum symmetric group? So is there a quantum group which sits between the symmetric group Sn and its quantum version Sn plus? We don't know. So recall what I said about the unitary case. Take a classical group here Sn and then ask for quantizations and uh, one quantization is this Sn plus, but is there another quantum version of it sitting in between these two? We just don't know. I mean, for the unitary case, my student and I, we showed that there's a whole zoo indexed by this uh, 
subsimi groups of the natural numbers, but here um, it's not clear whether there's any quantum group in between. Also, it would be nice to have Q deformations of these quantum groups, so going to the non-cuts case. If you're familiar with cuts and non-cuts, you might know that ON plus and UN plus, they have some uh, deformations defined by Shuzu Wang and Vandale, and we don't know for, for SN plus, for instance, whether there's such a deformation. Then uh, SUN was mentioned, so there's a quantum version by Wodonovich, SUQ2, or I mean, it's also studied in other contexts, um, for this SUQ2, we have a diagrammatic uh, description, but for SUQN, we don't. Okay, so Voronovich in his article, he gave some generators in terms of diagrams, but you cannot describe the whole representation category just in terms of diagrams. So that's, that's not known. So these are some known facts and some unknown uh, facts. <laughs> if a fact is unknown, I don't know whether I should call it a fact. So, so these, these are some, some objects here. Um, I see that I'm slowly running out of time, but let me now spend five minutes also on, on quantum permutations, so the other part of the story. So not supergroups of SN+, plus, but subgroups of SN+, plus, quantum automorphism groups of graphs. So uh, we had this uh, free symmetric quantum group SN+, plus, uh, which were defined by these magic unitaries. And we say that a quantum permutation is just a matrix that satisfies uh, these algebraic relations up here. So if you have a matrix U with entries from some C star algebra satisfying these relations up here, we call it a quantum permutation matrix. And again, if the elements are scalars, then I just have a permutation matrix. So here's an example of a permutation matrix. The entries are very harmless. It's just zeros and ones. So there's a, a permutation matrix, as you might know. And here's a quantum permutation matrix. So now the entries are two by two matrices and uh, they do not commute and they satisfy these uh, relations up there. So you see it's pretty quantum, right? Because the, the, this permutation matrix, the first particle is mapped to the third particle. But here, the first mat particle is mapped to a, a little bit to the third particle and a little bit to the fourth particle. Okay, so that's pretty quantum, isn't it? So that's the, the quantum permutation feature here. And these quantum permutation matrices, they play a role uh, in quantum symmetries of graphs. So you can define the automorphism group of a graph just by saying it's, uh, permutations of, of, of vertices. So let's take a finite graph with n vertices and let's permute these vertices. And if two vertices are connected before applying this automorphism, it should also be connected afterwards. So that's the automorphism group. It's a subgroup of Sn. And this is the definition here. And now you can define a quantum version of it in a similar way. So we just ask quantum the, the, the C star algebra generated by quantum permutation matrices, which uh, intertwine the adjacency matrix. Okay, so they commute with the adjacency matrix, just like for the automorphism group. That's a quantum automorphism group. And a graph has quantum symmetries if this quantum automorphism group is really larger. So the quantum automorphism group contains the automorphism group as a subgroup. And if it contains it as an honest subgroup, then we say that the graph has quantum symmetries. And uh, that's a feature that's pretty, um, well, difficult to, to guess if you're, if you're just given a graph, it's difficult to guess whether this graph has symmetries or not. So here's, for instance, a small graph which has quantum symmetries. So here for this graph, we have more ways of quantum permuting the vertices than just permuting them. Here's a graph which has no quantum symmetry. So my PhD student, Simon Schmidt, uh, studied these objects uh, for quite a while. And uh, so yeah, he has a number of papers on it. So, so there are many graphs which you can study and ask whether they have symmetries or not. And recently, uh, there has been a nice result by Theo Banica and Jeremiah McCarthy. I think uh, Jeremiah is also here in the audience. audience. There's a, a no quantum Fort theorem. So the Fort theorem, says whenever you take a subgroup of Sn, 
it can be written as the automorphism group of a graph. So now the question is, take a subgroup of SN plus, can it be written as the quantum automorphism group of a graph? And the answer is no, there are some quantum subgroups which cannot be written in this way. So there's no quantum fourth theorem, which means that, uh, yeah, there can be strange quantum subgroups of SN plus which do not come from automorphism groups of graphs. So again, the quantum world is a bit richer than the classical world here. And with these uh, quantum permutations, uh, you can also describe um, the, the representation categories and you can again describe them in terms of, of uh, some combinatorial objects, namely by, by, by graph categories. So let me be very brief here. But like with the easy quantum groups, you can define certain combinatorial objects and certain categorical uh, features, namely bilabeled graphs, and then you can uh, express the representation categories again in terms of, of some combinatorial objects. So you have a kind of easy quantum uh, groups which come from these from these graphs. And here a lot uh, can, can be done regarding examples and classification um, and so on. So this is uh, uh, br briefly about the representation category, but maybe let me come to a link uh, with quantum information at the very end of this talk. So if you're given two graphs, gamma one and gamma two, we say they are quantum isomorphic. If you find such a magic unitary, so such a quantum permutation matrix, which intertwines the adjacency matrices. Okay, so, so recall the automorphism group intertwines the single uh, adjacency matrix, but now I have two graphs. So if, uh, if, if this holds true, then uh, we say that these two graphs are quantum isomorphic. And uh, if my algebra here, this A is just a complex number, numbers, then being a magic unitary means being a permutation. So this means in that, in that situation, my graphs are isomorphic. Okay, so um, we have, so yeah, I should write the isomorphism. Oh, uh, where is it? It's here, here, here below. So uh, two graphs are isomorphic if and only if we find a magic unitary whose entries are scalars. So this is really like isomorphism of graphs, but now with operator valued entries. And the funny thing is, uh, whenever two graphs are isomorphic, they are also quantum isomorphic, but there are graphs which are quantum isomorphic, but not isomorphic. Okay, so that's a very nice feature. There are graphs where you can permute where you cannot permute the vertices and get the other graph, but if you quantum permute the vertices, you do get the other graph. So here's, here's an example of, of, of such, such a graph. I'm just showing it to you. Uh, it's very hard to, to see anything here. So just showing you it exists and it's very hard to, to see it uh, as a human being, uh, just by watching on it, that, that these two uh, graphs are not isomorphic, but quantum isomorphic, but uh, well, you, you, can, you can do it, so it's a, from a paper of Monchinska and Robertson. There are graphs which are quantum isomorphic, but not isomorphic. And this has uh, some consequences. And uh, this is my last slide. This has some consequences uh, for some uh, quantum information theory game. So there's a nice theorem by Laura Monchinska and David Robertson from 2019. And it links a statement from algebraic combinatorics with a statement from quantum information theory, with a statement from quantum groups. So that's a very nice theorem. And uh, let me, let me uh, spend the last two minutes on, on this one. So two graphs are quantum isomorphic if and only if the homomorphism counts from planar graphs into these graphs coincide. So if you've ever seen Lovar's theorem from the 1960s, then there rings a bell because Lovar's theorem says two graphs are isomorphic if and only if the graph homomorphism counts coincide. So that's a classical theorem from algebraic combinatorics. Two graphs are isomorphic if the homomorphism counts coincide. Now you might wonder, okay, 
apparently I have to check for all graphs whether these homomorphism counts coincide. So do I really have to take all graphs? So maybe it's enough to restrict to planar graphs. And the, the answer is no, you should not just restrict to planar graphs because with planar graphs, it characterizes quantum isomorphism of graphs and quantum isomorphism of graphs is not equivalent to isomorphism of graphs. So this is a quantum Lovas theorem, which is very nice and which surprised people from classical combinatorics because it really characterizes, uh, I mean, the right-hand side is just classical, right? And the left-hand side, you have a quantum phenomenon. And this is also linked with quantum information theory in the following sense. There's a quantum isomorphism game. Alice and Bob receive vertices from two graphs, VA and VB, and they respond with two vertices, WA, WB, and they win if these vertices are linked in one graph, if and only if they are linked in the other graph. So they must preserve uh, this edge connectivity of the vertices. And you can prove, so this is a non-local game, and you, you can prove that they win this game with probability one, if and only if the two given graphs are isomorphic, and if they allow to share an entangled state, so a quantum strategy, then they win with probability one, if and only if the graphs are quantum isomorphic. So that, that's a very nice uh, theorem telling us that uh, this quantum isomorphism of, of these graphs is linked with this, uh, this uh, game here from quantum information theory. There's some, some noise. And also this uh, description of the representation theory is also with the same means. Okay, so yeah, what, what, I, what I'm saying here is you have this quantum, uh, you have this quantum information theory game and it's described by quantum isomorphism of graphs. So with the help of these quantum permutations, you have this classical uh, notion of um, homomorphism counts, and this characterizes quantum isomorphism of graphs. And uh, the intertwiner spaces of these of these guys, they are also described in the same way, like here with this homomorphism counts. So it's a very nice theorem linking algebraic combinatorics, quantum information theory, and quantum groups. And as I said in the beginning, with this quantum mathematics, you have a long list of several theories, and you see here the theory of quantum information is linked with the theory of quantum uh, groups. Um, yeah, so this means quantum information theory and quantum groups are getting more and more friends these days. Okay, thank you. Sorry, sorry what are K and L in the last uh, 